welcome Helen here at Google today. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you for taking time um, to have me here. And thank you to the Google Asian Network for bringing me here today. Um, I am an author, as Amy said. I've been an activist for a long time. In fact, I was an activist before I became a journalist. And I thought I'd just spend a, a couple moments talking about how I got from there to here with um, my new book coming out, The Last Boat Out of Shanghai, the epic story of the Chinese who fled Mao's revolution. And so um, I'm the daughter of immigrants, as she said, from China. Um, my parents came to the US as part of this diaspora and exodus that I, I'm uh, writing about in my new book. But so I was born and raised in New Jersey. And I'm just curious here among all of you, anybody from New Jersey? Oh my god. <laughs> One other person who isn't ashamed to admit he's from New Jersey. And maybe there are some there in the live stream world, too. Um, but so at the time that I was growing up, there were so few Asians in America that it was as though when my family walked into a store uh, anywhere, it would be like every head in the room would turn and look in unison. As, and, and with that look, not like, hey, welcome, but instead it would be, what are you doing here in my America? And just that feeling of always um, being an alien. You know, and we talk about aliens today, but it was really like being an alien from Mars. And uh, that look, especially when you think about the 1950s, the 1960s, and even 1970s, every war that was fought was against people in East Asia. So as a kid, when we would go to the movies, um, you know, there would be that defining crescendo in a war movie where you know, it was like, oh, the Americans are winning, and we are going to kill them, kill them, kill them. And the them looked just like us. So when the lights came up in the movie theater, it, you know, we'd be with our little friends, and it'd be like, oh, OK, are you Japanese, you know, Korean, Chinese, spies, or, or Vietnamese? And, um, and so I grew up with a sense of that there were, you know, a lot of assumptions of who was Asian. And, um, and it didn't match anything I knew about my family at all. So I grew up with that sense of, of do I fit here or don't I fit here? And, uh, and so when the civil rights movement was happening, a time of great movements of equality for, uh, for people of color, for African Americans, for, uh, for women's and women, women and women's liberation, um, the gay rights movement was beginning then and of course the anti-war movement and peace movement. Those were all things that spoke to me. And so even though as an Asian American girl, I didn't see a lot of people like me at all in the media because we were totally invisible, except as aliens from Mars or as the enemy, um, I really wanted to be part of those movements. So you know, as soon as I was you know, around the age of many of you or somewhat younger, I, you know, in college, that was where I wanted to be. I wanted to be part of making a change. And I have to say, today, in, a, in not just America, but globally, there really is that sense of change, too, of people wanting to make a difference, of seeing that things are not going so well, not just here in this country, but elsewhere, and that, that we can do better. And so that was what the movement was then. It really was a youth movement, honestly. You know, All of those movements I mentioned, they were spearheaded by young people. And um, the thing about it, though there wasn't a lot of voice about Asian Americans. It was the beginning of an Asian American movement. And I wanted to be part of that for the first time, meeting people who kind of looked like me, who shared the idea that we didn't have to be second class citizens or constant foreigners um, you know, in the country we were born in. I mean, I was always told, go back where you came from. But I'd have to say, I'm from New Jersey, and I really don't want to go back there, thank you. <laughs> but um, of course, we know that that's not what they meant. And, um, and so I also had a great curiosity about China. That's where they wanted me to go back to. I had never been there. And so, um, so I became an activist. Um, you know, My whole goal as a young person was to get to college. But then once I got to college, it was what next? And I had no idea. And uh, as the daughter of immigrants, there were only a few options that I was aware of. 
you know, I, I didn't know what iBanking is. I mean, I still don't, but um, I investment banking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and so to me, it was either what, doctor, lawyer, teacher, or business. And I was a very shy uh, girl, you know, nothing was expected of me. And so, um, uh, so I never spoke up and I, I went to medical school. That was the only one I thought. And I ended up quitting medical school because once I got there, I realized this is totally the wrong thing for me. And, uh, and it was by a very circuitous way that I ended up going to uh, Detroit, Michigan after being a construction laborer, um, after I quit medical school and then got a job in a factory at uh, Chrysler Corporation in Detroit. And it was there that I realized what I really wanted to do was write about the stories that were completely unseen. And, uh, and these weren't Asian American stories. I was in Detroit. It was mostly African American and working class um, white and Arab American people. But that's uh, where I started out as a journalist, spent a whole career writing about many things, most of which were not about Asian Americans. So at a certain point, um, I just really felt, you know what, I've been saving stories all my life of things that other people should know about this. Other people should know about um, why being born in America makes you an American citizen. That was a Chinese American who fought that all the way to the Supreme Court in 1898. Everybody who's born in this country who can declare themselves a citizen owes their gratitude to Chinese Americans in San Francisco for that. And nobody knows it. You know, so there were so many things that I had saved and I thought people should know these things. And that's when I wrote my first book, um, Asian American Dreams, The Emergence of an American People. Uh, and as I continued writing books and stories, there were just so many other stories that haunted me. And one of those stories was about what I call a forgotten exodus, a time of people fleeing a country because they feared, uh, they feared the revolution. They knew, they might not have known what communism was, but they feared what was going to happen. And none of the places were more magical in China than Shanghai the city of, that compared with New York, London, Paris, and Berlin, and Shanghai. And Shanghai was only um, behind New York in terms of population, six million people in Shanghai. You know, Albert Einstein, Charlie Chaplin, George Bernard Shaw, uh, Eugene O'Neill, any number of writers and intellectuals from all over the world. If they wanted to go somewhere in Asia, it would be Shanghai. That's where the intellectual part of Asia was at the time, and that's where a vast number of people fled because they feared what was going to happen. They didn't really know, it's just they feared. And so, um, so it's a story about refugees, about exiles, about people who, um, who didn't know what was going to happen to themselves, but more important, to their families, to their children. And today we're in a uh, global refugee crisis. 70 million or so um, refugees all over the world. It's in the news every day about people who carry their babies for a thousand miles, not knowing whether they're going to get tear gassed at the end of it or have their babies ripped from their arms, which unfortunately is happening. But the thing about it is this 70-year-old exodus, which right now is it's the 70th anniversary, May actually was the, the date, the, the month that the People's uh, Liberation Army marched into Shanghai. And so 70 years ago this month was when this exodus hit full steam. And, um, and so I thought I wanted to write about it because there's not a single book, dissertation, or master's thesis on this topic in English anywhere in the world. And I know because I've hunted for it. And in Chinese, there are about three or four books, maybe today four, when I was researching, only three. They're in Chinese, they're all in Taiwan, and they're written from the experience of fleeing to Taiwan. Well, this diaspora fled everywhere. Just like diasporas today, people go wherever they can. And so, um, so this is the only book about it, and I'm just really thrilled to be able to um, 
sit here today and talk about it, talk about these things with, with all of you. So I, I think I'm going to be in conversation with Amy, and so we can, uh, I have no idea exactly what you're going to ask me, so we can get into it. Yes, um, and what I love about what you just shared is it's clear that there's a thread of storytelling that you employ throughout the entire course of your career and your life. You know, I'd love for you to start off by just talking about what you feel the power of storytelling is. And I, when I was reading the book, you know, there were so many powerful stories, you know, um, the one about your mother and, um, you know, I've read, I've heard recently about how you even found out about that story um, about your mother. And so talk a little bit more about what, what that power is for you around storytelling. So I've been a, a writer and a journalist for a long time, and some of those writings have been fairly straightforward. I did this research in ABC, this happened chronologically. And then other ones have been about people's lives and, uh, and what happened to them. And the thing about it is, and some of you may know more about just the you know, neurophysiological pathways about it, but human beings, we connect. We want to connect. We're social beings. And the way we connect is not through data and facts and figures. The connection is emotional. And that's through people's stories. And it doesn't matter whether those stories are about people um, from 1,000 years ago or 70 years ago or, um, or today. It's all about what happened to them. And that's storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so the way I connected with this book was through a story, the story about my mother. Um, I don't know if you want me to share what that's like. Please, is. yeah, um, for, for those out there who aren't as familiar with the book. So I had known about this title, Last Boat Out of Shanghai. In a way, it's a metaphor, but people talk about it. People, if you talk about anybody of a certain age, World War II generation age or Korean War age, growing up as you know, children or young people um, during these 1940s, 1950s period, they will tell you if they are... Um, Chinese and left China in those days. I left, my family left on the last boat out of Shanghai. We left on the last plane, the last train. We walked, we swam to Hong Kong. I mean, those are the stories. And they're all about being the last ones. And so I knew this um, just sort of intellectually. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered, well, what does that mean? What is that sense of panic? What would drive you, any of us, to leave the wonderful, you know, the jobs we have, the comfortable homes, the, the communities, the people we love, and we only have three tickets to go, who will we take? You know, all of those things. What, what, would, what was that about? But it wasn't until I heard a story, and as it turns out, um, it was from my own mother when she was in her 70s, and I was already in my 50s. I had already written two books and spent um, a career as a writer, as a journalist. And, and, you know, you grow up asking your parents, your grandparents, your family members, you know, what was life like? What was life like when you were a kid? And my mother would always say, oh, that was wartime, a bad memory. And she would never say anything. And then you grow up thinking, well, they're never going to tell me, or maybe there's nothing to tell. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until that I was, you know, having dinner with my mother, a full-grown adult, and I, I just said, oh, mom, too bad you can't tell me what life was like for you as a kid growing up in China. And that night she said, all right, you want to know, I'll tell you. And I, you could have knocked me over with a chopstick, and, you know, and I put <laughs> mine down, and she put hers down, and she began to tell me um, about being an abandoned girl when she was six years old, that her, her father had taken her on a special trip that she thought was going to be just such a wonderful thing. And instead, he took her to a strange place and left her. And she, from that point, it was a story of, of the uh, war with Japan begins, World War II for China lasted eight years. She's a child growing up in wartime China. She ends up in Shanghai, is abandoned again, and makes her way through a city a huge city that was um, under wartime occupation by a terrible memory and a terrible enemy, and somehow makes her way to, um, to the United States on the last boat out of Shanghai. So she tells me the story, and I was so 
like, you know, of course, my whole world changed hearing my mother's story. But at some point, I wanted to know other people's stories, too, mm -hmm. to be able to put my mother's life in a context. And I began interviewing other people, finding other people, doing more than 100 interviews and uh, with people who had survived this. So the stories I got were amazing. And that's, that's how I thought, if I'm going to tell the story of history, history can be a recitation of facts, or it can be made personal. So that you're reading about people's lives 70 years ago, but, it, but how to make that real so people feel like, that could be somebody I know. Mm -hmm. What if that was me? Mm -hmm. What would I do? And, and that's, the, that's the power of stories. Yeah, absolutely. I think what I found just so compelling throughout the whole book is that, as you said, the stories feel both personal and universal at the same time. Like, there are a lot of very real-world implications today for these stories. I mean, I know you said that you spent so much time interviewing hundreds of people, and you landed on four just incredibly powerful stories. How did you land on these four specific ones? Obviously the one, you know, one of them being about your mother. Well, this book took me 12 years. Mm -hmm. Part of it is because uh, it's such a dynamic, one of the most tumultuous periods of the 20th century. Uh, the changes going on in the world after World War II and the revolution in China and the complete realignment with the Cold War going on, you know, the communist block, as they called it, and the countries like the United States that were the former allied countries. And so there was a lot going on to capture that. But so these individuals living through that time, their lives were, frankly, pretty much of a mess in many ways. They were living in total uncertainty. It, it was like living with tectonic shifts under your feet all the time, except they were global geopolitical changes. And where do we go? What do we do? And um, so interviewing 100 people, more than 100 people, and hearing their stories, some of it is then the writer part, the craft part mm -hmm. kicks in. And you think, how am I going to tell this story? It's their stories, but it's also a history I want to encompass. So it has to be people who not only have, in, mo in almost all cases, several dramatic stories to tell, but, but memories that were quite detailed that could yeah. take me from their childhoods to their teenagehoods, their young adult times. Um, two of them went to college, well, the college times, um, going across the world, you know, and landing in different places, and then being able to describe all that. So that narrowed it down. But also some diversity. Yeah. I wanted, you know, there were two girls and two boys I focused on. I was very clear you know, war and occupation and flight is, is gendered, too. It's a different experience. I mean, it's, it was terrible for all, but a different experience being a boy and a girl. I wanted different class backgrounds. You know, the, the reputation of people from Shanghai is that they're all rich. Well, guess what? A million people, they're not. <laughs> and, and in fact, you know, there was a huge income gap, you know, there, too. The vast majority of people in Shanghai were incredibly poor. Mm. So I didn't want them to all be educated and, and wealthy. So um, I have one who was a, uh, the daughter of a nationalist, a, a Guomintang, the, the, the side that lost the war, the revolution. Um, so there was politics involved, too. One was the son of a collaborator. His father sided with the enemy, with Japan. And we know how that war ended. So you can imagine their life when Japan was occupying China was amazing. And then as soon as the uh, surrender documents, they were out on the street. And so, um, so that was partly it. But they each had amazing memories. Mm. They each, and, and people, people actually say, wow, how could you remember such things when you were such a small child? But in some cases, one was maybe three or four years old, and she saw uh, Japanese soldiers come into their house in the middle of the night, point a bayonet and a sword at their mother, ask for their ID, um, their IDs, and make a move toward her mother. And then her mother stood tall and stared them down, and they left. Now, you would remember every detail of that if that was your mother, no matter how old. And so they remembered these things because they were such incredibly, um, not just dramatic, in many cases, traumatic things. Mm -hmm 
and they remembered what was the color of the room. They remember, you know, what people said to each other, the sense of that. They remembered their feelings. And so these are people who yeah. had to also be open enough and reflective enough to tell me, um, what was it like when your father was in prison and you thought that he might be executed at any day? You know, and mm -hmm. to have them tell me those things. Now, they didn't open up their lives, especially of terribly frightening or tragic things until I had maybe met with them over a period of six years already to trust me with these kind of stories. My mother, it took her 70 years before she could tell anybody. She, mm -hmm. she had kept this a secret. And a lot of the people I talked to, they would just tell me about their lives. And the average age of the people I interviewed was about 80 years old. And at some point I would say, that's an incredible story you just told me of what you had lived through and survived. Does your family know this? And they would say, no, I don't think so. I, well, what about your kids? And their kids would be grown adults, right? Um, I don't think they're so interested. No. And, and then I would say, no, I really think you should tell your family. I think they would really want to know. And, and, you know, when people experience things like having to flee, or you can imagine what it's like to be on the border of the United States today and being separated from your children or being one of those children living in cages in a, on, a, on a hard floor. I mean, you're not going to tell about that and open up your emotions because it might take years and decades before you can even share that mm -hmm. or put it together or not fear being judged. Or in the case of my mother, um, as an abandoned girl, I think she feared being, you know, stigmatized, being made fun of. Kids did when she was a child. And so, um, so it takes time. I mean, yeah. we know that Holocaust survivors, it might, it might have been their grandchildren who found out, or people who um, experienced the incarceration during, as Japanese Americans during World War II. It was the grandchildren who first began to find these things out. Their, ki their kids had no idea. And so one of the lessons was, I mean, it was, a, it was serendipity that I just that night said, oh, mom, too bad you can't tell me this, at a point where she was ready to tell me. Mm -hmm. And had I not said that, she might not have ever told me. She might have been one of those other people who said, oh, I don't think, I don't think my family cares. They don't ask. You know? So one of the lessons is don't give up. If they say, oh, it's not, I don't want to talk about it now, you know, they might not say now, but in your head, say, okay, maybe some other time. Yeah. I think that really resonates for me. Um, I am the daughter of immigrants, uh, refugees from Vietnam who fled uh, after the war. And it's, you know, I think as I grow older, little by little, I feel like they're beginning to open up and tell me more things. And I think a lot of you know, what's, you know they, they have so much trauma around it, and I can understand, like, the hardships and challenges and difficulties they went through. Um, I think you, you know, are, you chronicle that here. You chronicle the challenges, hardship, discrimination that people fleeing their countries were facing. Um, I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about, you know, what was it like hearing these stories of just very real hardship, and how did that make you think about, you know, its implications for today? There were times when I was hearing stories that brought tears to my eyes as well as who was telling me the story. But the fact was we were sitting, uh, whether it was in Hong Kong or Taiwan or in China or here in the US, and they, were, they had made it to their 70s, 80s, or even 90s. Mm. And some of them had lived through many, many. I, I also interviewed people who remained in China too. and so. They had experienced the revolution, the many political movements, the cultural revolution. So every story had, had um, pain, but they also had joy to them because they survived the hardships. They also had inspiration and things that we could, could connect to. So that was the part that I really had to hold on to. And any writer or anybody working on a project that takes a long time, and especially 12 years as a writer, you're kind of by yourself doing this. There are times when you think, why am I still doing this? Is anybody going to care about this except me? You know, um, does this really matter? And so the part of it is those stories made me feel like 
I have a responsibility to the people who told me, who opened up their hearts and told me their stories. So I have a responsibility to them to honor their stories, to tell it in a way that they're entrusting me, the truth of their lives. Um, and, and then there's the broader picture too, because I wanted to put it together as a history of something that happened to millions of people that is completely forgotten, except by them. And so, uh, and then when you multiply it by their children, their grandchildren, their families, we're talking about multiple millions of people having experienced something that other people and other times fleeing um, Vietnam, the last helicopter out of Saigon, I mean, mm -hmm. all of those things are the last boat. Or leaving Syria today and putting your kids who can't swim on a rubber raft into the Mediterranean. And you don't know whether your kids are going to survive, but what you assume is that if you stay, they won't. And that's why they leave. And so then being able to make a connection to that and say, well, you know what, there's a larger story here because that's why people flee or that's why people immigrate. And this country being a country of largely immigrants, and I say largely because unless you were Native American, everybody's people came from somewhere else. And one of the lessons of this book or any exodus is that if families are doing okay, and I don't mean doing well, I mean, if they're doing OK and they can make it, they don't leave. They stay. Who would want to leave their families, their homes, you know, everything that they fought and you know, love? They only leave if they have to. And that applied to the pilgrims. It applied to every migration from Germany, from Italy, from everywhere else in the world. Um, and I think you asked me about the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. If people could connect to their own stories, no matter how many generations back, and really identify how hard that was for their own grandparents, great-grandparents, relatives, you know, ancestors. That might create a little bit more empathy for the people who are going through this today. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what it was like. I mean, writing it, feeling that, you know, you take these stories, you, you know, you take some of that, that energy from people, and you feel like, I have a responsibility to do something with that. So, so even hearing stories that were hard, it just made me feel like I have to tell this. Mm -hmm. People need to know. Yeah. It can't just get forgotten into the dustbin of history. Yeah. Um, you, you're sharing a lot. Like what, I, what I'm hearing is just this idea of connecting to our own history and the importance of connecting to our histories. You know, speaking of May, it's API Heritage Month as of That's yesterday. Right. Um, one thing I love about Last Boat Out of Shanghai, in addition to Asian American Dreams, which was published in 2000, is that I think you do a really, a really amazing job of melding both the personal story, but also with the actual chronicled history um, and specific historical incidents that have happened throughout Asian American history. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, you know, Asian American Dreams and what you wanted readers to get out of it in terms of the different modes of history and how that should, how that should shape and inform Asian American identities and actions and, and beyond? Well, sure. Um, Asian American Dreams was my first book. Mm -hmm. And I always knew, because I had collected stories and in the day before internet and so forth, I mean, all you had were the newspaper or magazine clippings. And I was a, um, you know, a dedicated news junkie. I would read everything and I would collect stories because I knew there was something more I wanted to, to find out behind the story and, and to tell it in a fuller way. And so when, um, having grown up as an Asian American um, daughter of immigrants, I just never saw our, our stories. And I would, I would, because I was Asian American, I would hear about these stories or the, the killing of Vincent Chin, for example, the hate crime that happened in Detroit when I was there. This is something that you know, some Asian Americans may not know. But even being Asian America, in America, our stories are, are I, I feel like we're robbed of our history. Mm -hmm. That these are things that are just not, they're not in movies, they're not in television. You know, OK, there may be things, some, some things now in the internet if you know where to look for them. But, so I reached a point where I, I really felt that I don't know when it is I'm, you know, what I'm waiting for to try to write a book. Um,
But finally, I reached the point of, of saying, you know what? In my lifetime, I've seen so many changes for Asians in America. Our population has grown tremendously from when I was a, you know, that Martian alien invader as a child who was completely invisible. Um, and even in those days, Bruce Lee, the great Bruce Lee, was only a uh, sidekick in TV. He could never be the champion himself. And so that was the way it was. And, and I just felt like these are completely missing the real stories and the real contributions and the real experiences of Asian people of Asian descent in America. And that, you know, this idea that we all just came here to take advantage, take the benefits, you know, work somewhere, take the money and run, um, which is a continuing, even today, uh, idea even possibly at companies like Google, you know, the, you know, are, are we really, um, you know, people who belong in America? What is our contribution um, that was missing? Yeah. And that's what made me feel like, finally, I, I have to tell some of this story because um, pretty much I was just fed up. And what was going on in the news was at the time when I was writing this in the, in the mid-1990s um, was saying that every Asian American who ever participated in this democracy and donated $10 to a pres presidential campaign that they were conduits to the People's Republic of China, even if they were from Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, India, Sri Lanka, it didn't matter. They would all, as Asians, be potential spies and conduits to China. Well, what could be more ridiculous than that? But, uh, but it was out there, and it was in the headlines every day, and that's what made me feel like, you know what? I have to write about this, and I have to show the real story behind, you know, what we've been doing in this country and why everybody born here is an American citizen, um, how the um, separate but equal laws were overturned as unconstitutional in the 1800s because of Asians in America, and all of those things. So, so that's why I, I, I wrote that book, and I, and I feel like today, we're still in that space, and it, it, it's painful to watch um, because the media, and I include the internet and internet content to that, so often um, goes to the lowest common denominator. You know, if everybody can jump on this and agree with this, okay, it gets the most hits, this must be true. When in fact, there are things we have to dig for, we have to look for it because it's not there. You know, in a way, we have to be intelligent not just consumers, but we have to be um, detectives on our own. And in doing that, in finding nuggets of history that, wow, I didn't know that. This affects me. It's, it's why I'm a, I, I'm a citizen, because I was born here. Which, by the way, there are some people trying to change that, even after you know, 1898, when the uh, Supreme Court decided that. Um, we need to be informed about it. And mm -hmm. so, um, so even in today's space, I think we all have a responsibility to try to try to learn these things that have happened and pay attention, mm -hmm. stay woke. <laughs> um, you know, I, I learned about the murder of Vincent Chin when I was in third grade. Um, my, I remember my third grade teacher asking us to write an essay about, uh, about, I forget what the essay topic was actually, but I remember my third grade teacher asking us to write an essay and the thing I had chosen to write my essay about was the murder of Vincent Chin and you. And what was shocking to me is when I wrote this essay in third grade, no one around me knew who he was. Not my family, not my friends, nobody around me, no one at school. This was the first time that a lot of people had been hearing about it. This was the first time that I had been hearing about it. So for you, you know, what really drew you to Vincent Chin's case and why should this case matter to Asian Americans today? Well, so I was in Detroit at the time that Vincent Chin was killed. And I was just beginning my life as a journalist. Um, you know, I had been an activist up until then. I wasn't really clear what I was going to be doing. But I was in Detroit. Um, I had been working at a Chrysler stamping plant in a factory. Um, and why was I there? It was really because friends of mine had said, if you really want to know about the heartland of America and, and really be an organizer and think about change and social change in America, you should go to the heartland. And so I thought, oh, good idea. And being young, I went to Detroit, not really knowing a soul there. And, um, and so I happened to be working in Detroit when the entire auto industry collapsed. And I know it's hard for uh, probably most people 
listening or watching to, to imagine. But um, in the last recession, nobody wanted to call it a depression. That was a depression. Millions and millions of people were out of work and had no idea when they would have a job. And these were high paying jobs. This is when minimum wage was about $1.30 an hour. And working in a car factory, you were getting $10 an hour. That would be like minimum wage today at $15 an hour if you're lucky, and instead getting a job that paid 60 bucks an hour. I mean, imagine what a difference in your life it would make. And so these were people who were permanently laid off from jobs that got them not only a house, a second house, a summer cottage, two cars, a recreational vehicle, all kinds of vacation, health care, retirement, all that stuff gone down the drain. And what happens when people are really miserable in a mess, way like that, not knowing? They start wanting to find who to blame. And the finger of blame ended up on Japan. Why? Because the dinosaurs that uh, Detroit produced in those days that could get maybe seven or 10 miles a gallon, if that, um, the competition was either Volkswagen or Japanese cars, which could make, uh, which could get, you know, more um, gas mileage. And gas was so expensive in those days, most people couldn't afford to drive their cars anymore. That's why people lost their jobs. And so Japan was blamed, and anybody who looked Japanese. So anybody with an East Asian face was considered to be part of the enemy. And remember, I had talked about the wars preceding. So the whole idea of, of, of uh, that you could have been you know, the enemy from Japan, from Vietnam, from Korea, from China, and now the Japanese cars. So if you were Asian, East Asian, driving uh, and walking down the street in Detroit, you knew you could be attacked. I mean, the climate was so thick. The only thing I can compare it to today, today was right after 9-11 um, and the Islamophobia that we still have in this country today. And sadly, so many killings even in recent days. Um, but at that time, a young man named Vincent Chin, who was Chinese, not Japanese, happened to be um, out for his bachelor party, the all-American bachelor party. And uh, two auto workers, two white auto workers saw him and can I use bad language? Yes, OK, oh, give right. thumbs up. Um, saw him at a uh, strip bar for his bachelor party and said, it's because of you motherfuckers that we're out of work. And you can imagine what kind of reaction that would draw. And anyway, that turned into a fight that spilled out into the streets. And these two white auto workers chased Vincent Chin and his friend only his Chinese friend. There were other non-Chinese friends that they didn't bother with. But the two Chinese then were chased through the streets of Detroit. Um, Vincent tripped. One grabbed him. The other had the uh, uh, baseball bat and bashed his brains out into the street. And so that would have been terrible enough. But it was witnessed by uh, probably more than 100 people because you know it was just a busy night that night. And two were. Um, off-duty police officers. And so there was no question that they had killed Vincent Chin and said what they said. But um, when it finally came out to getting sentenced, the uh, sentencing judge said, uh, oh, you're not the kind of men who should go to jail. Uh, you're clean cut. And he didn't say clean cut white guys. But you know that was the implication in a city like Detroit. You're not the kind of men we should send to jail. So he gave them probation. And so for beating another man's brains out into the street, they were given probation. And, um, and that created an uproar. But why it was so important was because, it, you know, at the time in the 1980s, the Asian American community was very um, separate. It was each ethnic community. There wasn't something called Asian American. It was your Chinese American, Vietnamese American, Korean-American, Japanese-American, and Filipino-American. And those were the major um, you know, uh, Asian ethnicities in the Detroit area at the time. But it was a minuscule number. And the Asian-American community came together. 
calling itself Asian American, to say this was a violation of, of Vincent Chin's civil rights, and these men should be punished for doing that. And it became a national civil rights movement with the improbable epicenter in Detroit, Michigan, of all places. But it was something that every Asian person in America felt, because whether you were in the Midwest or not, you really felt like people hate me. They're looking at me because this country is in a depression right now. And it's because of you know, MFs like you that we're out of work, or that we're suffering, or that our economy is bad, or that I can't get a mortgage anymore, or all of those things. And um, so it was the moment that, um, that Asian Americans really started in a mass way talking about civil rights, race in America, where Asian American people fit into a dialogue around race, which you know, um, up until then had been completely either black or white. And Asians is like, what is this? They were the, the Martians from Mars, the aliens from Mars, like I was as a kid. Like, who are you? What are you doing here? Where do you fit? You have nothing to say about race. You're not black and you're not white. And, and that was the moment. And that's why it, it's um, so important in many ways. There have been many other hate crimes against Asian Americans, sadly to say, since then. And today, we seem to have an epidemic of hate crimes against so many people. And um, um, but it was a time for Asian Americans where, you know, it's like step up now and, and raise your voices as a community. Yeah. That idea of step up, step up now and raise your voices as a community is something I think we've been talking a lot about um, in the Asian Google Network, this idea of solidarity. Um, I think it's one of the strongest themes that comes through in Asian American dreams. You talk a lot about the solidarity of our community as it relates to how we came together on Vincent Chin. Then you talk about times when our community didn't come together. You know, you also talk about times when our community has stood up for other communities, other communities of color in particular, and times when we haven't at all. And so can you talk a little bit more about why does solidarity within our own community and also with other marginalized communities matter? Oh, well, solidarity, connectedness, sharing each other's stories, having a feeling our common bond as human beings, you know, let alone as uh, uh, people in one country. I mean, that's what, that's what makes us move forward as a civilization, mm -hmm. as um, it's what separates us from other animals and species, you know, this ability to do that and, uh, and to build on that. And so, um, so it's vitally important. And the flip side of that is keeping people divided. And we are at a time today where divisiveness and pitting one group of people against another is uh, being honed to a fine art and blasted every day, not only on TV and movies, but every tweet that comes out. You know, there's so many of them that are just filled with venom and hate that um, you know, it's all you can do to just say, well, okay, let me protect my little cocoon and my little, you know, uh, one square foot of space that, um, you know, I'm standing on. But in fact, if we only exist for ourselves, and that applies to everybody, not just Asian Americans, but everybody, if we only think of our own self-interest, that's the easiest and surest way to be manipulated, to say, well, you know, Asian Americans, you all go to Harvard. You know, why should you care about a, a lawsuit that's happening at Harvard right now? Well, in fact, the vast majority of Asian Americans, and studies show this, go to community colleges and state colleges, not even UCs, and ha face the same issues that every, everybody else, the economic choice of can I make it through college, or do I need to help support my family, and all of those things, but this myth has become um, to not just separate, for example, Asian Americans um, apart from other people of color or people of conscience, but that, you know, uh, it, it, to me, it's like a bad rerun in another way of when I was growing up as a kid, when we were so completely invisible, nobody saw us. Now it's a way of saying, well, you're also doing so well, you're actually almost honorary white people. and. Um, and so you're invisible too because you blend in with the scenery. And the idea of blending in with the scenery is, um, 
it's, uh, it's counter to the whole idea of, you know, as humans, we want to be recognized. As, as people in a, in a world, we want to be, you know, um, and that's the power of stories, too. It's being acknowledged. You know, I have humanity. So do you. So does everybody. And, but do we see each other and do we hear each other? And that only happens when we're connected and we can share with each other. I mean, with the share that common interest with each other to do something that will benefit all of us as a society or a community or as a workplace. I mean, that's why the connectedness is so important. And um, that's why I wanted to tell all of these stories, because I think that's a way to pull people together. Thank you. So we'll open it up to audience questions now. We have a question on the Dory. Oh, I'll great. Go ahead and read for you. Yeah. Um, this question says, setting aside history and cultural roots, in your opinion, how important is it to grow up with mastering mother tongue other than English? What's the impact of speaking a language other than English to assimilation? If my kids aren't interested in my native language, should I lose sleep over it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> language. <laughs> yes. Boy. So when I was a kid growing up, during the McCarthy period, when people from Asia and especially China were all viewed as potential spies or a fifth column um, meriting, a fifth column against the United States, my father said to my mother, don't speak Chinese to the children. Because he knew and he experienced discrimination just in the way he spoke. And my father spoke perfect English, but he did have an accent. And as a kid, I saw him ridiculed and it was painful. And, um, but my father made that decision, and as an adult, I have regretted it every day. I mean, uh, so I grew up as a monolingual, you know, typical monolingual American, knowing only English as my culture, and then having to, you know, study other languages, but um, not Chinese. And it wasn't until I was uh, in college that I actually took a couple Chinese classes. So I can speak at a level of, I think, about a two or three year old. <laughs> but not enough to have a conversation and not enough to read. And so it is, if your child speaks another language or two or three, each language I think just multiplies their ability um, to be somebody a meaningful, have meaningful understanding and connectedness in this world, multiplies them you know, tenfold each time. And you know, for me, I know not even being able to speak or read Chinese, that cuts me off from an entire culture. It makes it so, in doing my interviews, you know, I, I did not, you know, my interviews had to be in English. Um, I did have a translator, I did have other people helping, but I knew I was missing nuances. Why did they pick this word and not that word? And if kids are unwilling, I mean, of course, we all know, you know, for kids, it's like, I want to be like everybody else. I want to go play. What, are you going to make me study this language that nobody in my, among my friends speaks? Unfortunately, it's, you know, um, one day they will thank you. And that's, you know, um, I'm told that's true for musical instruments, too. But it, it's really true for language. Just the ability to travel in this world and, and be in other places, it's, it's critical. And I'm sure in a workplace like Google, being able to uh, know other language, a you know, multinational uh, company that has um, viewers and people all over the world. You know, the more languages you speak and the more you can connect there, I'm sure it's, it's an asset. So um, I, I wish my father had never said that to my mother every day. Um, as a proud queer Asian American, I'm interested to hear your story or biggest challenge you have as a lesbian Asian American? Uh, so <laughs> as, a, as a, a proud queer person of color, Asian American lesbian, I mean, the first thing is it's assumed that we're not. I mean, I have been told, especially whether it's Asian, Latino, African American communities, being queer is a white thing. You know, why are you, you know, you, you don't exist. Our community, the entire continent of Asia, there are no gay people, what? And that in itself is hilarious to think about. Um, even China recognizes at this point that they, they have queer people. And um, so the challenge has been 
number one, knowing that you can pass and, and, and kind of be invisible. Um, and layer that on being an invisible Asian American and also as a, as a woman, you know, being walked on or stepped on, you know, by people who are like, oh, you're female, what do you, you know, matter. Um, I don't want to be invisible. I think that's harmful. I don't think anybody really wants to be invisible. And so, um, so the, uh, the biggest challenge, I think, is, is, is being um, seen completely as a full human being. And, um, and so there was a, a time in my life when I didn't feel confident about being out. And I think that's true for, for every, every um, queer, gay, lesbian, um, you know, bi, trans, uh, you know, person um, to be understood and to see, be seen fully. And um, so anyway, you go through this time of, should I tell people? And the hardest part was actually being able to tell my family, you know, because these are the people that know you and love you, we hope, and, uh, and as well as my community. And so, um, so I actually went out, well, I, I went through a, uh, a, a period of time that I wrote about in Asian American Dreams, where I was already an activist. I was already very, very involved with communities of color, including Asian American ones. And I had a, what I call my lesbian trial, where um, I hadn't come out yet. I didn't even know, you know, I was at that point where I, you know, wasn't sure. Now they call it questioning or, or whatever where you're just not sure of your identity in every full way. And, um, and so I was real involved with uh, feminist, um, feminist movements. And in these women's organizations, there were some lesbians. But in the way that, um, that a lot of, sort of in the misogynist way that uh, feminism is disparaged, uh, it was like, oh, if you're a feminist, you're all lesbians. And therefore, the 300 women who had come to our citywide meetings in Boston must all be lesbians. So my um, uh, organizing community that I was in, which was Asian and African American, called me to a meeting one day. And it was like a space like this. And when I got to the meeting, they were sitting in a semicircle. They were all there. And it's like, oh, everybody's here. And they said, yeah, you sit here. And it's like, oh, in the center? And it soon became very clear that um, I was the topic of the meeting. And uh, one by one, the, the, the head of the Asian um, uh, community organization, the collective, he said, um, well, you're here because we've noticed that you're hanging around a lot of lesbians. And we need <laughs> to know whether you're a lesbian or not, because we could not have you uh, in our community as part of our organizing because you would bring discredit to us. And the head of the African American Collective says, that's right, in our, in our black community, there are no gay people. And he didn't use the word gay. But there are none. And you know, it's a, it's a symptom of white, petty bourgeois decadence. And so uh, if you are a lesbian, uh, we, we wouldn't want to have anything to do with you. And, or any other Asian, you know, so it was sort of like, oh, everybody is going to be. So Helen, tell us, are you a lesbian? And I sat there thinking, well, I don't have a membership card. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't get the toaster oven. I've never held hands with a girl. I don't know. But I knew it was clear if I said yes that I was going to get excommunicated from this community that I was part of, that I, it was my, my spiritual home at that point. And so tell us, Helen, are you a lesbian? And I said, no, I'm not. And it was at that point I stepped back into the closet and slammed the door shut. And so, um, so for me, it was, uh, I guess I would have to say, quite a circuitous path to eventually coming out and, and it was shortly after that that I actually moved to Detroit because I was up. one other reason was I just felt so ashamed that I had you know closed the door not only on myself but all of these feminist women liberation um, you know um, activists too. I mean, how could I face them when I basically had said you know 
So that was another reason I thought, OK, a good time to get out of Dodge and go to Detroit, where I pretty much stayed in the closet for, for quite, a, quite a long time, I think, for me. You know? and, um, but anyway, I mean, as things happen, life never travels in a you know, straight, <laughs> straight line, so to speak. Um, but it goes in zig zigzags. And so that was a big zigzag for me. But it was also why I ended up in Detroit. And so I was in Detroit, and that's where I found this, you know, Asian American community and became part of a, you know, a national civil rights campaign. But then eventually found my way to come out as a, as a lesbian. And, um, you know, I'm married. I've been married three times. And I have to point out, all to the same woman, because, <laughs> because marriage has been such a contested fight to be able to even be married to the person that I've been with for 27 years. And so, um, and is still in jeopardy because of the way the Supreme Court may turn out. And so anyway, there are all these things. There's no right that's fully guaranteed. And, uh, and that's why we all have to be active. And that's why, as a, um, an Asian American queer person, I need to be out there too so that people can't say, oh, Asian people don't have anybody who's queer. You know, um, and, and that was a slogan that came out of the, you know, the, the uh, HIV epidemic. You know, come out, come out. If you can come out, you must, because silence equals death. And I think that slogan is true for every, every a community, every underrepresented community, every marginalized community. Silence is death. We have to show who we are as full human beings. Because if we don't, nobody else is going to do it for us. And, um, and so I think those are the, you know, a continuing challenge. But thank you for that question. Thank you so much for your question. I believe we are at time, um, but it went by very quickly. But thank yes. you so much, Helen, for being here in conversation with us today. We really appreciate your time and just feel so honored to hear from you. I don't know if you can tell, but you are my shero, one of them. So, <laughs> thank you. so this was a huge honor for me as well. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you all. And thank you, Asian Google Network.